Hey guys, Scooter Street here. Have our um, uh, part two build of this Yamaha Zuma 50 engine, uh, or BWE 50 engine, depending on what country you're in, uh, uh, as well as MBK Booster uh, 50. So this is just the vertical Minarelli engine. In part one, it was a bit more boring. It was basically just pulling the factory engine down, removing the factory crank, which had a stripped spline on the variator side, um, and um, pretty much putting our, uh, our full circle performance crank in with new bearings, We've also put new seals in this fella. So we're pretty much ready for this part two to um, put the new Molossi 70cc sport cylinder kit in. Uh, we're gonna be assembling the transmission as well with a uh, Molossi multibar variator and a new belt as well. And uh, sort of cleaning everything up on our way through as well. Um, also gonna be installing some of the more boring parts which is the um, oil pump, uh, putting it all back together. Uh, the electrical components like the starter motor, uh, the stator, the flywheel all those little bits and pieces which were removed to do the crank rebuild. So this one will be a little more um, interesting and exciting than part one was. I also have Ray here with me today, so it's gonna make filming a whole bunch easier. So I have two sets of hands on this thing. So I'm really excited to get this engine together. We also have the exhaust, which we're uh, gonna be um, bolting onto it. We're shipping the whole engine back to the customer, so we may remove that exhaust uh, prior to shipping, but we're gonna bolt it up. And um, so everything's sort of all sitting there together and. Uh, a lot easier to see when you have a, a totally removed engine. So I'm excited to get this one together. So we're going to uh, rip into it and uh, get this thing uh, going. Okay, so first of all, I'm going to uh, get our piston on. So usually um, what we'll do here is um, put the variator side, well it doesn't really matter when you've got the engine out, but most of the time uh, it's easier to, um, to put the variator side uh, circlip in uh, first. That way when the piston's on there, you're only worrying about putting one circlip on. Because obviously when you've got the piston loose in your hands, it's a lot easier to, to get that cir circlip on. So, Ray's I'm just going to go ahead and, um, and get that fella in. Now, I mentioned earlier about having a little oil pan uh, ready when we're, um, when we're doing stuff, uh, particularly with the crank, and uh, also with the piston as well. So, we, uh, we usually just have a little pan of oil on the side. Uh, just so as we're assembling things, we can um, just give them a, uh, a light coating with two-stroke oil and um, just get them um, really nice and lubricated because you want everything going together uh, really really nice and freely, which is only going to happen if it's well oiled. The key here is being fairly liberal, but um, you don't want it just dripping with oil. Just a nice uh, thinly spread coating throughout. So on the piston where the rings go in, obviously there's uh, little ring pins, which is uh, fairly crucial that the, um, the ring sits within those pins properly. So uh, when we're inserting it, usually it will insert it uh, prior, uh, insert the piston prior to putting it onto the actual uh, cylinder studs. One of the big things here as well, very crucial, is making sure, you see this uh, Molossi piston has an arrow right there at the bottom. Now that arrow denotes the position of the piston so that it faces the exhaust. If you put the piston in upside down, you're going to have uh, some major problems. So, and this, uh, this is mainly to do with uh, some of the pistons like this one have a window, but uh, some of them don't. But um, the other, the, the major thing is those little ring pins, what you want is for where the, the ring ends, which is where the ring pin sits, you want that to be passing through the cylinder on an area where there's no ports, so that there's no possibility of the ring end uh, slipping out and smashing into the top of the port, which I've seen before when customers have um, uh, put, the, um, put the piston in upside down. So it's really important that you make sure that, that arrow, uh, on the lossy pistons it's always an arrow, uh, some uh, standard replacement pistons will say EX uh, or E for exhaust, but um, the marker always points to the exhaust. That's really, really important. Okay, so small end bearings in there, ready to go. Put our first circlip in there. So 
So the key here is patience. So basically, we're just trying to get the um, the uh, gudgeon pin to slide nice and neatly through that small end bearing. Now, with most uh, 50cc engines, which are horizontal, uh, there's not really a danger of um, not, not a lot of danger of parts slipping into the engine casing. But obviously, with this vertical uh, vertical engine, if you get something wrong here, the part's just going to fall straight down into the casing. So uh, we have the engine out of the bike, obviously, so it's not going to be particularly difficult to get that part back out. But if you have uh, your engine still in your scooter, it uh, can be really painful to um, get that part out. So what we'd uh, commonly do, particularly when you're doing the circlips, and we'll, uh, we'll no doubt do that in a moment, but it's a really good idea to stuff a rag just um, down the top of the ports down here, uh, just so that if, uh, if the circlip does slip out of your tool while you're getting it in, uh, it can't fall down into the engine casing, because even in a situation like we're in now, the engine's out of the bike, if the circlip falls down in the wrong spot and sits into one of those uh, crank bearings, it uh, can be virtually impossible to get it out without splitting the casing again, which we're really not not wanting to do. So pretty much uh, basically what we have to do now is um, sit this um, this very outer side circlip in. With the Piaggio engine, we usually uh, will install uh, this circlip first, and then uh, so once the cylinder's on, uh, we're, um, uh, we're only having to do the exhaust side circlip because it's got a little bit better access on the Piaggio engine. On this engine, uh, if you have a look around here, it's actually got a, a big old um, chunk of casing that flares up here. So on this particular engine, it's going to be uh, easier to do the, um, the very outer side circlip. But basically what you're wanting to do is just think ahead and make your job easy. So whichever circlip is going to be the easier one to, to put in uh, once the cylinder is in place, uh, that's the one that you want to be doing uh, once, um, once the cylinder's on. So do the opposite side first. Now, I wish I could say there's an easy cheat to doing circlips. There's just not. Sometimes they are just really painful. So there have been plenty of times where we've um, gotten it first go. There's been plenty of times where it's uh, taking 20 minutes. So it's just one of those things. It's just being patient. If you can feel yourself getting frustrated, stop, take, it, take, the, take a deep breath, have a drink of water, and I'll come back to it because the frustration is, um, is not going to help you get it in. So you see uh, some of the... Uh, some different pistons come with like a G-style uh, circlip or an E-style circlip. Now this is where they have a little uh, a little tag on the inside of the circlip, which can sometimes make it easier to get in. The uh, the Molossi uh, circlips are traditionally a C circlip, uh, which um, can be sometimes a little bit more difficult to get in. But uh, you see the right the way that Ray's done that. I've actually got a special set of uh, needle nose pliers that we've. Um, I'll zoom this in. There we go. Special set of needle nose pliers, which actually fits into that little slot, that little slot there on the piston, it sits in there. So I can just get the end of it in and then uh, use that slot for the end of the pliers to sit in to, um, to pinch it into place. And usually just use a flat blade screwdriver just to give it a little push and just make sure that it's really snapped into its little seat in there. Because um, if a circlip comes out while the bike's running, you're, uh, you're in uh, a, a real lot of trouble. There we go. That's all looking really nice and good. One of the really great things about the Molossi heads is they um, use an O-ring head gasket. So uh, obviously uh, with a, um, uh, a paper or more commonly a, um, uh, an aluminium gasket that gets uh, squashed down, uh, they usually have like a, little, uh, like a little recess pressed into them. So they're sort of single use. So if you do need to remove your, your head, you have to replace the head gasket every time. These Molossi heads with the O-ring gasket are really clever because you can remove the head uh, basically as many times as you like and uh, not have to remove that gasket. So we'll, um, we'll replace it rather. Go ahead and pop that one on. There you go. So what you want to do is just have a look under and make sure that's seated nicely because um, particularly with these vertical engines, uh, we usually, uh, on, the, on the recess on the inside of the head, when the uh, head gasket goes on, we'll put a little bit of two-stroke oil, which you may have seen a little bit of shininess while I was holding the, um, holding the head. But um, they can, obviously, because you're putting it down upside down, uh, a little head gasket uh, O-ring can slip out. So it's a good idea just to make sure everything's sitting nice and flush and that hasn't happened. So we're just going to um, pop these head nuts on, not particularly tight, just sitting them in place for the time being. Now, uh, because this engine has been removed and uh, sent to us, there's a couple of parts that the customer hasn't shipped us. 
not only the raid valve, uh, the engine cowling, there's a couple little bits in the kit, uh, these here in particular, which are, um, are little spaces for the cowling, which we're obviously not going to uh, be able to install. And obviously uh, pretty much all the uh, Molossi 70 kits come with, um, so here somewhere, a little uh, uh, carbon reed petal. Uh, usually the factory one is made from um, from steel. So obviously we can't install that because it's another reed valve, but there we go. So if you have a torque wrench, it's a really good idea to torque wrench these. Um, had a customer ask about this actually recently, uh, or someone asked in the comments. But the thing with this is, when we're doing this, um, Ray's been here for, what, Ray, about 13 years or something. Um, so um, we've uh, built these engines many, many, many times. Obviously, um, a torque wrench is a really good tool, uh, primarily for making sure that you don't over-tighten things, obviously. Under-tightening is an issue as well, but um, uh, over-tightening is one of the big things of this because the casing's uh, alloy, uh, or aluminium primarily, um, it's quite soft. So um, with the steel, steel bolts and nuts, it's very easy to over-tighten them. Now we've got a pretty good feel for it because we've been doing it for a long time, and that's just um, how experience works. But um, uh, if you have a torque wrench, it uh, is a really good idea to um, to use it if you don't have a, a bunch of experience. Now you see Ray's um, uh, with the pattern here, mainly using a, a cross pattern, so always using that cross pattern so you keep the um, the, uh, the stress even rather than over tightening one side. There we go, just uh, turning the crank to make sure everything's sitting nice and neatly. One of the really cool things about these um, these Zoomer engines, the old school vertical engines, is that the reed valve, the way that it works, instead of uh, the, uh, the intake coming through the top of the casing and then going through the casing up to the cylinder, like it would on a, uh, on a horizontal engine, these here, uh, some of the fuel is just going directly into, let's turn this crank, see the top of the piston, just coming up and coming back down. So some of the fuel is coming uh, and air is coming up through these ports directly into the cylinder and now uh, the rest of it's going down into the crank and then up through the ports like it would with a, a horizontal. So a bit of an unusual setup but it's pretty cool that you can see the piston uh, uh, right there working as it does its job. A little bit unique with these engines. We're going to do our squish test now. So we would ordinarily do this with any uh, cylinder kit install but particularly if you've done a crank um, just to make sure that uh, all the stroke and everything is exactly the same and how it should be. It's a really good idea to do a squish test. Really highly, highly recommend it. I think Molossi usually recommend it in their instructions as well. So the solder we recommend, this is good uh, like 2 mil thick solder. So you get a really good level of squash on that, um, on that solder. Pop the starter clutch down there on the, um, on the crank to get a bit more leverage to twist the crank. But what you're really looking to do, see is uh, bent it into an L shape. I'll just grab that right. So you'll see um, uh, on the end of it there, get this in focus, there we go. It's uh, squashed and flattened out the bottom of that solder. And that gives you a squish, which is basically how close the piston's coming to the top of the head. Now from experience, we've found most of these kits uh, are somewhere between a, a, a 1.4 to 1.8 mil squish. Um, and um, that's why we use the two mil solder, because it gives you a really, uh, a really good basis to, um, to get a, a definitely accurate squish level. Because, um, you know, if this came back at 1.8 or 0.8, sorry, that would be a little bit concerning. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, grab our vernier calipers and give that a measure. There we go. So 1.9, what we might do is just test it again just to make sure. Um, usually just use the other side rather than, um, than uh, wasting it. Just bend it into an L shape. And uh, the key is making sure that when it goes in, making sure that the solder's uh, touching the outside of the cylinder wall. Now, if you do test it a couple of times, there we go, it's a really good idea to, um, to test it in a different position of the cylinder and uh, make sure that the piston's going over that solder and squashing it sort of at least three times at an absolute minimum. Now, it's not exactly an exact science, but see, often we'll come back with a slightly different number the second time round. Yeah, there we go. So it's going to be around 1.9. Look, it doesn't really surprise me uh, this engine's a little bit unique, um, but it has a slightly bigger squish rating. So I'm pretty happy with that. If it came back at 0.8 or something outrageous like that for a sport kit, you'd be a little bit worried. But um, I'm pretty satisfied that 2mm is, uh, or 
you know, close enough to two mil, sort of 1.9 mil, is uh, well and truly safe. Because what you don't want is um, the piston smashing into the head, and you don't want pre-ignition issues either. So we're on to one of the boring bits now, obviously. We're going to do our transmission in a moment. But um, uh, pretty much assembling our oil pump system and um, uh, the rest of the uh, the stator and the, uh, the flywheel, etc. So giving this a really good clean out as well. There's a fair bit of corrosion and stuff around. Ray probably spent about 20 minutes just giving the engine a really nice clean over. So we've got a, a bunch of grease. We're going to be re-greasing the inside of here with the oil pump the oil pump drive. And um, uh, obviously the, the Minarelli engine uses a slightly more complicated system than the Piaggio engine because it's got the, um, the oil pump built into this side. But it's got a special little pin inside here which one obviously we've saved. So obviously when you're pulling it apart, make sure I don't lose that. But a uh, special little pin in here, gonna re-grease everything and get this all back together. Just mentioned, so obviously uh, this system uses a uh, plastic gear which is being directly driven by the crank, held by this couple of circlips. So it's a really good idea to um, to grease pack this because the plastic gear here is driving the gear on the oil pump, which is obviously what's pumping your oil. So what you don't want is just, uh, for this system to be unlubricated or overheat and strip this plastic gear, which I uh, which can happen. So um, obviously what you want to do before we go and put the gasket over top of this is um, turn the crank a number of times, which is why it's a good idea not to put the spark plug in until the very last um, the very last part of the engine build, because uh, obviously put the spark plug in, uh, the piston's gonna be compressed and you're not gonna be able to very easily turn the crank. So uh, spark plug out, so you can nice and easily turn that crank. What you wanna see is this oil pump gear here, as you're rotating the crank, it will very slowly turn. Definitely something that you wanna check uh, before you go ahead and put the gasket over because if you've uh, misaligned this when you put it in, or been a little bit too forceful and it's not quite lined up, it can strip that gear. And um, say you do have an issue with the gear uh, and it's not pumping, you get to 100 meters up the road after you've just spent countless hours rebuilding your engine and you seize the piston because the oil's not pumping. So definitely uh, a key thing to check before we um, uh, continue assembling the rest of this.
Okay, so I've just popped our Molossi Variator Packet apart. Uh, this is the 075 kit, so this pretty much fits all of your uh, Minarelli or Yamaha 50cc uh, two-stroke models, whether it's the horizontal or the vertical. Obviously, the horizontal with this bike is really just a later version of the vertical. So, first thing we're going to do, uh, even though we've done it a million times, uh, is uh, read the instructions. Uh, article, uh, blah, 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 670B, which is the 5 mil thick, the thick washer. Uh, blah, 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 570B, must only be fitted to the Malaguti F12 liquid cooled, having a fanned crankcase made from year 2000, blah, blah, blah. The other, uh, the first one, which is 2 mil thick, which is this washer here, the thin one, must be fitted to all other models. I flicked to the page before, we know straight away that washer goes in behind the variator. Just before we put it in, I just wanted to show you quickly the difference between the factory variator and the Molossi variator. Now this is very obviously the, the uh, factory variator. It's pretty dirty and uh, the, uh, the Molossi variator is really nice and, and beautiful and clean. But I'd guess from looking at this variator, that, um, this bike's been sat out in the weather or transmission cover's been left off for a short time, which is why it's got so much oxidization. Though keeping in mind it is like a 30 year old scooter. So look, one of the big differences between these two variators uh, instantly noticeable is they use different size rollers. This is the factory roller out of the factory variator and this is the Molossi roller. Now you see straight away the Molossi roller is a fair bit bigger. Uh, the, um, this is just the, um, the sort of bottom of the range Multivar 2000 sort of basic Molossi variator. And this uses a 16-13 size roller whereas the factory variator uses a 15 by 12. Now one of the big advantages of using a larger roller is you have more surface area. Now, the reason this matters, if you have a look at this roller, it's a perfect example. Massive, big, flat spot. Uh, actually, usually there's two of them. There's another one there. Big, flat spots on the roller. Now, what this is from, as the roller wears, particularly when it gets hot, it's uh, moving up and down the inside of the variator, what tends to happen is it eventually, uh, it won't always roll, it'll tend to slide, and uh, it'll wear a little baby flat spot. And it's one of those exponential issues where, the more flat spotted it becomes, the more quickly it, it flat spots even further because that flat spot just kind of gets stuck because it ends up basically being a low point on the roller and so it kind of gets jammed into place. Um, so uh, basically it just continues to get worse and worse. Now when you have a larger surface area, the uh, essentially as the roller is guiding up and down the inside ramp on the inside of the basket, there's a larger surface area of plastic, uh, what makes up the roller material, uh, contacting, so it's less likely to cause that flat spot. This is uh, so much so that uh, obviously with uh, the Minarelli factory, it's a 1512 uh, size roller. When you go up to the Multivar 2000, Molossi uh, upgraded to a 16 by 13. Um, Molossi make a couple different MHR variators for the Minarelli engine, but the top, top one, uh, which is the overrange variator, actually comes with a uh, 19 by 15.5 size roller, which is the same size as the Piaggio factory roller which obviously there's a huge difference there. So um, yeah, obviously Molossi know this, they've been uh, making scooter performance parts for a very, very long time. So uh, they consider it that crucial that um, in their top performance variators, they uh, always use quite a large size roller. And if you compare the two of them, there's a huge difference in, um, in the surface area size when it contacts the inside of the variator. Now, obviously this is just the Multivar 2000. So it's just using the 16 by 13 size rollers. But for this application, the, um, the, the Multivar 2000 is the best variator to use. You could go put a, um, a super high performance variator in it, but um, this one here, value for money, and the application, um, this is going to be um, probably the best variator to use for this instance. And to be honest, I'd recommend uh, installing one of these variators in just about any bike, unless you're going to be putting some uh, really high revving uh, performance parts on it, like a, um, like a Bridgeport cylinder kit, or a really top end exhaust that needs lots and lots of revs. For pretty much any other application, these um, uh, basic Multivar 2000s are a fantastic option. Now, the one other thing I mentioned is um, the uh, guide size on the Multivar also has more surface area as well, because it's a fair bit fatter than the factory size guide. Now these obviously wear also over time. Generally they'll wear a little groove on the inside, and so um, when they sit in the ramp plate, they get loose and they move side to side, which this one is, it's a little bit worn. But uh, what this basically causes excess movement, and in a really bad case where it wears completely through, you end up with the, uh, the, backing, the backing ramp plate essentially just jamming straight up against the metal of the basket. 
I've seen a couple which were really badly grooved in here because obviously metal on metal is no good, which is what the guide is there to, um, to stop from happening. But this is another sort of exponential issue in that the more movement there is as this uh, starts to wear, the more movement there is, uh, the quicker it wears. So having a little bit more surface area with these Molossi guides is um, also going to be a big benefit. And you're going to get a fair bit more serviceability uh, and life out of those guides before you have to replace them. Okay, so we've uh, got our basket assembled. We're going to start um, actually installing the variator onto the um, onto the variator side of the crankshaft. So I've got our, our thin washer first, and um, it's going to go ahead and put the basket on which we've assembled. Obviously, have our um, our new variator nut here, and the um, the special little star washer that goes on these Minarelli engines. Now, ordinarily we would put the um, the fan pulley or the outer pulley on at this stage, um, and probably put the belt on as well, ready for the rear pulley. Unfortunately, the customer hasn't sent us the rear pulley on this one, so what we're gonna do is we'll um, uh, probably put something in place to hold the variator in place for when it shifts, so it doesn't come apart and the rollers and guides fall out everywhere. And um, we'll um, slot the, the star washer and the variator nut in place, ready for the customer when he uh, gets the engine back and is uh, ready to essentially install the belt and assemble the rest of the transmission with the parts that he's uh, still got himself at home. So we're going to continue with the rear part of the under variator uh, installation, which is uh, putting the contra spring in that uh, in the rear pulley. Got our rear pulley assembly here. Obviously we need to pull that nut uh, off to remove the clutch and get that contra, the new contra spring on, get the factory one out. Now we'll just note, the nut size uh, on the Minarelli is a slightly unusual size. It's actually 39 mil. It's very, very difficult to get a 39 mil socket, so or, or a spanner. So we do actually sell um, a, a special tool for these, um, the the variator tool. But um, what we what we do in the shop, as we have uh, an impact driver, we've actually gotten uh, a one and nine sixteenth inch uh, uh, socket for our rattle gun, which is really close to that. Uh, 39 mil size, about as close as you can get without being able to get an actual 39 mil socket, and uh, this uh, this works quite well. So we'll go ahead and uh, and uh, grab this one off. Now, when you're doing this, you'll uh, notice we usually will put our um, feet on the outside of the clutch because it is spring loaded, and um, when that nut comes off, if you don't have some weight holding it down, it uh, can spring up and smack you in the face. Go. So I always like to just quickly check the function of it. So no point in assembling broken parts. So it's a good idea just to check that the uh, torque driver is twisting open uh, as it is supposed to. Usually they'll twist open from an anti-clockwise direction. So what I'll often do is here is back the nut on first and um, that way you make sure that the thread drops on and uh, you always, always do it up with uh, either the spanner uh, or the socket as much as you can by hand before touching it with the impact driver. Obviously the reason for this is quite a fine thread and there is uh, a, big, uh, a big potential for accidentally cross-threading it and uh, if you do that, the, uh, the nut and the torque driver are gonna be finished. So. Very, very important. And uh, as always, put a pen mark on crucial nuts and bolts like that so you know if they've um, uh, come loose and turned. So we'll go and chuck this back in the scooter now. We're gonna go ahead and install the rear pulley assembly onto the shaft. So we'll, um, what we're gonna do first, we're gonna grab the belt and uh, as always, even though we're not actually fully installing the whole transmission because we don't have that rear pulley assembly, we're gonna slide it onto the, um, onto the rear pulley uh, now just keep in mind that uh, virtually all of the Molossi belts do have a directional arrow on them, so you just need to follow that. A basic rule of thumb is if you're looking at the scooter, uh, looking at the casing, and the Molossi uh, uh, writing or the logo on it is um, facing you, then it's usually the right way if it doesn't have an arrow. So it's going to squeeze it into a torque driver. This just allows us to um, uh, get the belt on uh, and squeeze it over that front pulley there. So. Normally we'd obviously have a, um, an outer pulley or a fan pulley on the front, we don't right now. So I'm going to go ahead and put the bell on and I'm going to put that special Yamaha nut on there. As 
as always, going to pen mark. Well, the great thing with these pen marks, similarly you might see trucks that have uh, little yellow plastic tags on the wheel nuts. Essentially, it's exactly the same concept. You can uh, just glance at it and see whether the nut has moved. Now that we've got our transmission cover on and we've got our main stand on, we've uh, just propped the engine up with a block of wood at the back. Obviously, uh, the uh, the engine isn't bolted into a scooter, so I just wanted to get it up off the workbench so we can uh, fit the exhaust properly. Now, um, the question that we do get asked often is uh, how to fit exhaust correctly, and uh, we've certainly seen it done incorrectly many times, which can lead to certain issues. So, I just wanted to give a rough explanation of uh, essentially what you need to be doing when you're fitting up your exhaust. Now, the most important thing with fitting this exhaust up is that you get a nice firm seal on the header and that you're not putting additional strain on the studs. Now the way this is done, I was going to start off with our exhaust bracket. Now you notice on this bracket that instead of just having holes, it actually has slots, which allows the, uh, the bracket to be bolted into um, sort of a, a slight variation of different positions. So obviously up and down, that can be slid up and down on these little slots. Now the reason for this, uh, Exhaust manufacturing isn't an exact science. Uh, if you line up uh, two identical exhausts, as they're uh, often hand welded, there's going to be very slight variations between them in how they fit in the exact location they fit up, which is why the manufacturer puts slots in the brackets to, um, to allow for this very slight variation. So the correct way to do this is going to put these bolts into here. Obviously, we're going to fit our bracket up first before we fit the rest of the exhaust. So we're going to do our bolts up. All right now, just to the point that they sort of bite in, and undo them half a turn. Now, what this does, it allows the bracket a bit of movement, so that we can sit the exhaust in place. And once we feel that uh, the exhaust has been seated to the header properly, then we can manoeuvre the bracket into the to correct position to match up with the hole on the exhaust tabs for the mount. And that way, we're locating the bracket. Uh, in terms of where the exhaust wants to be located rather than trying to uh, forcibly maneuver the exhaust to fit the bracket because we've bolted it up solidly first which is obviously the wrong way to go. So I'm going to let Ray finish fitting this one up. I'm going to uh, go and get the exhaust bolted up to the cylinder uh, obviously with the gasket and the, um, the studs. I've put some, uh, some nice brand new studs on this and some uh, really nice exhaust nuts that we sell. The big advantage with these is they're a bit deeper than an average nut which gives you a bit more to bite onto. Uh, and obviously it gives a thread a little bit more to tighten onto as well, which reduces the possibility of stripping that thread or having uh, the socket turn over in the thread. It gives you a bit more to grab on the socket as well. So I'll go ahead and, uh, and start fitting that one up. Now I just wanted to show you, this is an issue that can happen every now and again. Again, I mentioned that exhaust, you know, manufacturing exhaust isn't an exact science. So you'll see where the weld is down here, hasn't given the nut enough clearance to, um, to actually, see that's starting to tighten up, to actually engage the, um, the flat plate, which is supposed to be bolted flatly to the cylinder. Now, if I was to continue doing this up, what's gonna end up happening is the nut because it's, uh, uh, it's basically hitting the weld just on the inside here, it's going to eventually start to bend that stud. And um, if you keep doing this, you keep over tightening, it's going to eventually snap that stud off, which I've seen happen before. So what we're going to do, we're going to tape this exhaust off. We're going to grab our, um, our Dremel tool. You can use a die grinder or even, um, if you're very, very careful, a grinder. And um, I'm just going to nick the edge of that weld off, probably make a marking on it first, just to allow enough room for uh, that 
nut to sit in place properly. Now, uh, with the slots on, uh, as with the slots on the actual mounting bracket, these uh, uh, header plates often have little slots in them as well, so they can move side to side to get the correct positioning. So I'm sort of going to hazard a guess and say, because we've uh, uh, tightened this one up first, or very roughly tightened it, that uh, when we uh, make that small nick in this one, if we do need to move the exhaust over very slightly, it's going to end up encountering the same issue on this side. So we're going to go ahead and, uh, and remove a tiny bit of the, um, the uh, edge of the welding on both sides just to allow a full operational movement of that flat plate uh, so we have a bit more um, uh, opportunity to fit it where it needs to fit uh, when we come back to it in a moment. Now that we've made an adjustment to the um, little welding spots there, so we've got just enough room on both sides. So I'm going to go ahead and um, not sort of tighten these all the way, like just to the point they get firm, maybe undo about a quarter of a turn. Same on this side. Yep, that's firm, and then undo about a quarter of a turn. That just gives the pipe a little bit of ability to be able to move up and down as we continue with the rest of the fitment. Now, as you can see, guys, I apologise, we have skipped a couple of steps here. Now, the reason for this, uh, any part, particularly exhaust, which are mass-produced, which are quite particular in their fitment, maybe one in every 50 or, or, or 100 is going to have... A, um, it's going to be a slight anomaly and um, is not going to fit up quite exactly the way that you want it to fit up. Now, because we're quite particular at the shop here, we uh, will not allow anything to fit the shop that is even remotely questionable uh, by our standards, which are quite high. So going with that, we've noticed that um, because of the design of the bracket on this Technogas exhaust, the metal folds over and then it then meets uh, the, uh, the welded tab on the back of the exhaust where it mounts. Uh, we've noticed that the, uh, the little fold where the metal folds over has just been contacting this um, this metal, uh, this welded tab to the exhaust. Look, we probably could have just bolted it up, but um, we just weren't super happy with it. So um, what we've done is I've just uh, gone down to the local bolt shop and got some uh, little stainless steel washers, which we've just built up four of them there, which seem to be about the right amount, so that we could um, just allow the exhaust to fit up a little bit nicer. Well, as I mentioned, maybe one in every 50 or 100 times this happens, uh, any mass-produced part is going to be prone to uh, little anomalies um, are occurring every now and again, but certainly not a big issue, uh, and I'm uh, really happy with how it's um, how it's fitting up now. Just to show you, it's a little bit difficult to explain, much easier to show. Uh, where the bracket bolts to the scooter, uh, you can see where this uh, uh, the edge of it's folded over from the factory, it was just contacting this um, welded bracket to the exhaust. So obviously with, um, with the spaced out bolts and the spacer from the factory, there's uh, no contact there now, which is exactly how we want it. Thanks for watching, guys. We uh, really appreciate your support and uh, your, your views, obviously, give us more ability to make videos like this. So um, hopefully you've gleaned some, uh, some useful information from this video that you can maybe apply to your scooter, even if it's not a Zuma or a BWS50 or a Booster overseas. Hopefully there's some information you've been able to use. Now, um, obviously, this is a more street-orientated build, uh, being that it's a more basic cylinder kit and exhaust, but... If you've got a more race orientated or a higher end uh, setup on your booster or your Zuma 50, let us know in the comments what you've got, what parts you've installed and tuning setups, and um, what sort of performance you've been able to achieve with this setup, because we're interested to find out. And um, obviously any information that you put in there is going to be useful to other scooter, scooter owners with similar scooters who will be able to glean some more information from that, which is what it's really all about, uh, helping, the, uh, helping the scooter tuning community. So. We've got some uh, some more videos coming up shortly. We've been really busily filming um, a couple of Piaggio engine uh, and liquid cooled uh, liquid cooled Piaggio engine build that we're doing shortly as well. So keep an eye on our channel. Look, guys, we really appreciate your support and um, uh, all of the views and the comments uh, just allow us to make more content like this. So make sure you put in the comments if there's any other videos that you, or engine builds that you'd like us to um, to do, and we will endeavour to um, to do our best to to get those videos out to you. Thanks, guys.